Hi, everybody. The, uh, the rest of time is over, the long holidays without the paint-alongs. I missed you all. I, I just, the Saturdays are not the same when I wake up and I say, and I scratch my head, what am I going to do now? So, you know, um, I just love to see you all. So, uh, I hope you all had a nice Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And Hi, I everybody. hope your New Year's resolution is... The, uh, the rest of oh, wait, I have to... Long, wait, am I getting a feedback? I hope your, um, your New Year's resolution is to paint a lot and get better, and I, and I can help you do that. All right, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Johannes Flodaus. That's a Dutch name, by the way. And um, I've been a professional artist for over 30 years. Um, adept in all the mediums, and I've done about, I would say, around 3,000 paintings during my, my lifespan. Um, fortunately, I, had a, I have a motorhome, and I've traveled all over the United States and Canada, and places in Mexico without the motorhome, but in other ways, doing a lot of plein air painting. I've done probably about 400 paintings just outdoors. So um, I have a lot of experience, but um, it, it wasn't, I had a lot of difficulty in the beginning because I had this assumption that I had to copy from nature. I, I fell for the trap about representing nature accurately on, on a canvas or from photographs. And it took me years to figure out that that's not the way it's going to go. Uh, so my teaching is um, a somewhat more controversial than the norm because a lot of our uh, professional artists, they just teach the you know, copy what you see, and an evergreen tree is supposed to look like an evergreen tree. Those are all over YouTube, and uh, what I teach is how to create new symbols that are much more appealing. But I can't get into all the details because this is like a, a demo that was only for an hour and a half or so. But once you get into the classes, um, a lot of students know me for uh, giving an abundant amount of information, and I've come to the conclusion that there are about 200... Um, tips or 200 techniques or let's say golden nuggets to succeed at landscape painting and you're only going to be as good as how many of those pointers you know. I have them on a silver platter for you and I'm more than willing to share them with you with no reservations or withholding whatsoever. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, watercolor is tends to be a, a, a you know the, the most difficult medium. It's a very popular one and um, so I wanted to show um, all of you how to do certain brush strokes to make it easier for you to to create these these symbols so let's get started here and and we have Jude here who is going to assist me by reading out your text um, so go ahead and uh, type with capital letters she will read out loud um, so it gets recorded and um, and I can hear what she's saying because I got to focus on my presentation so one of the first um, not a brush stroke but it becomes a brush stroke is a wet on wet control and the application is most backgrounds so I'm a very firm believer that if a watercolor does not have wet on wet regardless of it doesn't have to be a landscape it can be a still life it can be animal portraits it can be um, uh, yeah landscapes anything should have uh, soft edges that's the beauty of the medium so we should not neglect that um, so I'm, I'm telling you the areas where they work, uh, foliage and hills except Rocky Mountains, things in motion such as waterfalls and crashing waves, and water reflections. So now we're pinpointing where to apply these. And I have uh, a little demo here for you. Let's go for it. So here's a technique, um, how to control. As you can see, when I just applied the paint right now, it just advanced. So there's no control. And so the whole that's a, that's always a big uh, issue for uh, emerging watercolorists. They say I can't control this. It just the paint is fugitive. It goes wherever it wants. So the technique here is, and I can only say this in you know in a very simple format. Uh, again, obviously during my paint along classes, uh, we will elaborate on this much more. But um, basically, that the so you can understand how to do this is forget for a moment that you have paper. And forget that you have brushes. Think of them as sponges. If one sponge is less moist than the other, it's going to receive the paint. If one sponge is wetter than the other, it's going to expel the paint. So a good analogy would be, as you can see, it's spreading out. Probably losing a little bit of control there. Um, 
in order to pick up spilt milk in a kitchen, you wring the kitchen towel and then you, it's, all, it's already wet, but it's moist. You wring it and then you can suck up the, the milk, the spilled milk. If you have a soaking wet kitchen towel, you're just going to spread the milk around. So you get my analogy here? Now, a neat trick is I started adding the wet on wet effect. You can see right here in this contour. Oh, it stops. I didn't know that. Okay. I was I wanted to draw on this and it stopped. Okay, I'll just put it right back again. Okay, so I'll just move this forward here. Okay, you can see Oh, I can I know where I can do it on my screen. Yeah, you can see over here, there's a pencil mark, which is the contour of that tree. Uh, I, that's, I put the paint in the middle of the shape, and, and you can see it swims about one-eighth of an inch or so. And so I'm waiting for that to suck up the, the water a little bit, and then I can control it. You can see my palette there. This is, these are excerpts from actual paintings, paint, uh, paint along courses. Can you remove that pen? Yeah, I will. Joe? I'm on it. And for those of you who are new, we welcome you all. This is a live class. We gladly accept every question you have. No question is a dumb one. The only dumb one is the one you didn't ask. So <laughs> That's ask. a good we uh, love new students and we love our old ones too, but I am very fond of many of you. It's so nice to see some familiar names and a whole bunch of new ones. What I like about the new students is because they, they hear things that they haven't heard before. Like they've gone to workshops and, oh, hello, Sue, I'm going to I'm from Ontario too. I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, just at the tip of uh, Lake Ontario. I'm sure you know where Hamilton is, so we're neighbors. And by the way, I saw someone type Spanish. Si hablan ustedes español, escríbanlo en español, lo traduzco al inglés y les contesto en español y les puedo dar las preguntas que quieran. I'm a hundred yes, percent. He said he was from Brazil, Joe. Oh, that, but a lot of them do speak Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, uh, cool. okay, t please type your questions in capital letters so that uh, Jude can detect it because she wants to also enjoy watching the video. Uh, so that way we can Well, answer. I also watch the video so I can point out something Joe might have missed, like a particular brush stroke I'll see that he's so accustomed to making. I'll say, did you see that? Um, the colors he's using, you want to go through your colors, Joe? Yeah, I mix my own. I, I don't really like using pre, uh, you know, um, so prefabricated colors. I, I find a good palette would be Prussian blue plus the ochres and, and yellows would, would probably give you a good palette. Uh, the only time I would use um, Hooker's Green, for example, would be for seascapes. But in general, I'm not happy with any of the greens that you can find in watercolor. By the way, you can ask questions about oils and acrylics as well, and pastel. I'm adept in all of them. And not only landscapes, you can ask me about portraits, still lifes, um, animal paintings, pet portraits. I can cover it all. I like a, what do you call it, internal doctor in a hospital? Or, or internalist, something like that. Something like that, anyway. Okay, now I'm doing a, a dry brush technique, which is very nice for um, watercolor, where you, well, we're going to get into that a little bit further down. Yeah, where I'm going to, LA is asking me about a brush stroke to make bushes in the background. I'm, I'm going to cover it all, LA. You know, you're almost like LAPD. <laughs> I was going to say that. Yeah, I, I, it covers it all. Especially during the paint along classes, what you can do is ask me a question and say, Joe, uh, I, I want to learn how to do this. It takes me about five minutes to demonstrate something anyway. So I always have an extra sheet of paper next to me. And when I get a request, I, I attack that paper real fast in that way because I really strongly believe in step by steps. Step number one, Stu, step number two, etc. Okay, so. No, Daniel, there are no additives to the water. Watercolor is just pure water and the paint itself. There is no retarder like with acrylics. 
That's right. You don't want to retard it anyway. You want to uh, you want it to dry relatively quickly. Okay, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. But the the idea of the wet on wet is now when I applied that that foliage behind the the chimney or what, that's not a chimney. It's got another name to it. Anyway, that protrusion on the roof. Um, it was the paper. The, the the paper was a little bit drier than the actual brush. So when you apply the paint, it doesn't advance. The, the trick is to be able to hold the contour, but yet give it that blurry kind of effect. Okay, let's see if I have anything useful here. Oh, here I'm gonna do another application. Oops. Doesn't Nico, it? you can use ultramarine blue. Again, if you mix your greens, it doesn't matter what blue. Joe uses uh, Prussian blue because it has a touch of green in it. So it harmonizes with other green. Yeah, you can use ultramarine blue, but take into account that it's a little bit grainy. So it, it leaves like, it settles, it's it's mined from minerals, so it settles in the in the little um, valleys of your paper. Now, I want, to, I want you to see this here. The very distant tree, this is, this is a key, by the way, for watercolors. This is a great technique. The tree that's in the back is all blurred out, correct? All soft edge. But look what I'm doing to the tree in front of it. It's hit and miss. And I'm using, look, look at the, dry, the, dry, the dry brushing technique there. All that indicates all the little foliage clusters. So you don't have a little pen-like brush and elaborate leaf by leaf. You just put one scoop there and at the very top left there of that tree, you can see that it comes closer now because it has a lost and found edge. And did you see those brush strokes, how he's pushing against his brush? And he's using the belly of that flat brush. Joe likes flat brushes. A lot of art. Oh, you can do with a round brush too. But it, the technique is to pretend you're shoveling snow, which so, so far we haven't had to do, Jude, this year, uh, and at least this season. But um, <laughs> <Not yet. laughs> it'll come. But anyway, it's like uh, shoveling snow. I push it forward, and that creates that breaking up. So you want to try that on a separate piece, piece of paper, um, especially if it's rough paper you get better cooperations where it breaks up nicely. Yep. Well, that's interesting. Mike says that ultramarine blue has a red basis, so the greens will be a little bit more muted when you mix them. That's that that is correct. On the color wheel, it picks up a little bit of red, but again, it's granulated, so that's, it leaves that for, you know, I, I don't like it for certain areas, maybe for rocks, but for trees, you, you get those little holes in it, those little sediments that I don't like. In oils, it makes it. Tarina wants to know, why do you use flat brushes? I just, I learned that way. Those were my training wheels, but I, 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 I can produce the results that way better than the round brushes. See, look how I'm dry brushing there. And you can yeah, see with one stroke, I painted a hundred leaves. Now, again, if you're using rough paper, you get a better effect. I just want to add, if you ask a question and I miss it, please restate it. But also be aware, many of the people in the chat have been with Joe for all of his years and know your answers. So please check your, the chat to see if somebody answered your question for us. So here we have a nice effect, which is lost and found edges on that second tree. That for me, and I, and I don't know why it's not mentioned enough during other watercolor artists' workshops. The most exquisite contour that you can have on foliage is um, a soft edge, a couple of inches, then you have hard edge, and then another soft edge, another hard edge, then you got some broken up paint. There's a very important concept. I can't elaborate it now, but during the paint alongs, I've come up with something extremely important. And, and I mean it, it's the number one valuable technique in all painting, and that's the one that's neglected the most in talking about. Professional artists do it, but they don't, they don't put words to it. And it's called the principle of contrasts. And once you understand that, your painting will go up leapfolds. Um, you can see there how that tree, how it, you know, sort of like 
looks. Now, another advantage of how it looks soft in some areas and broken up in others. Another advantage of the wet on wet is a watercolor has this property that it's razor sharp when you apply it on dry paper. So if you don't control the wet on wet, it seems like you cut out the figures and you pasted them on with glue. So you want the, uh, the edges to, to seem like they belong in context by bleeding right into the paper, but you want to be able to control it. Hey there, Paul. All right, let's go to the next one. So this is the finished painting. And you can see once again, there's a combination here of hard edges and then some blurred edges over here. All soft over here. And then suddenly you get some hard edges over here. Pretty cool, huh? And that's another example of wet on wet effect that really pushes that tree really far back, doesn't it? Okay, spot wetting. Application, closer foliage. We just saw that. Uh, peep one motion. Uh, that's a great technique. How do you, how do you, when you put, add people like in towns and stuff and cities or animals that are moving, uh, they, they don't look right when you take a photograph and they're standing, they seem like they're posing. Like, don't, nobody move. It doesn't look realistic. It doesn't look believable that on city streets, everybody's standing still. Um, so in order to create the illusion that they're moving, you, what, what you want to do is uh, make their legs look like they're going um, out of focus. And that seems, it creates the illusion that they're actually walking. So this is the application for it. Spot wetting. Some areas of the figures would be hard edged and others would be soft edge. There are a couple very famous artists that do that. For example, Alvaro Acosta, and yet I'm sure a lot of you know him. Um, he, he, one of his techniques is that he creates uh, fo figures that are out of focus in some areas, especially if they're near the periphery. Uh, waterfalls and crashing waves. So that's the application there. Let's look at another little video here. So if you want to apply some of these um, to your oils or pastel, what he's saying is soft um, spot wetting. You, that means you would just have softer edges in some areas. And we know how to do that in oils and smudging with your pastel. There's ways to apply all of this to the different mediums. That's correct. Thank you, Jude, for bringing that up because um, the principle of contrast has to apply in all mediums. So here we're, we're creating a background where we have the effects that some of it bleeds, but some of it comes into focus. And um, that creates that lovely effect. So once again, the, the wet on wet technique for background, not only for backgrounds, but for, for many areas is probably the best way to approach this. Uh, Alvaro, yeah, they'll type it for you. Alvaro Castanet does a lot of uh, cityscapes. He's, he's worldwide famous. and. Um, and he does figures. That's all he paints, by the way. He does figures that are out of focus. Uh, look how I'm using that same brush, but I splayed the bristles to create the evergreen trees. See, some of the areas bleed and others don't. Okay, so I'm spot wetting. Spot wetting means that you, in some areas you wet the paper and in others that you, you don't. So whenever the pigment hits the wet part, it spreads out. Whenever it hits the dry part, then it becomes into focus. So that's the lovely technique there. I'll speed it up a little bit. In fact, I can go time lapse. See, especially that evergreen tree that's closer to the middle, that one that comes right out of the painting. Look how some of the edges are hard edged and then some of them are soft edged. That's the way to do it, in my view. And that is also, Ruth, what is meant by lost and found. Some are hard and some are soft. Oh, see, Ruth is, picking up, Ruth is picking up some very valuable information right now. You do that, by the way, yeah. with oils, too. See, look at that lovely okay. effect. And you know why? Because if you create all this hard edged, it tires the eyes. And again, it looks fake. It, it looks like it's coming forward too much. Things are too much in focus. But when you let some of it bleed out, it brings relief. And then the parts that are hard edged 
uh, you enjoy them more and your eye focuses on them. So it's like music. You have up and down pitches. Poetry. Poetry with a brush. Yeah. Joe is uh, showing us snippets of his painting because he's trying to show you all of, what is it, 20, 25 different brush strokes? Yeah, so imagine. We want to get through it all. We would be here until tomorrow morning if I went to go do it all this live. But, but the paint along classes on Saturdays are all live. Um, I start from the scratch. There's no such thing as a video. And the interesting thing is I've never done those paintings before. I always take this risk where I start a painting from the scratch every Saturday where I have a class. Never repeat a painting. In a certain way, that shows a certain degree of confidence that the principles that I teach work because my students can say the opposite if, it's, if they want to, but I haven't ruined 450 paintings in 13 years. All of them have worked out. So that... That's a lot of home runs, so that means it's not, I'm not trying to boast myself, but I'm trying to show you that if you apply the principles, that again, many, in many uh, workshops, they don't talk about them. I, I've watched quite a few YouTube videos, and I, I keep saying, tell I'm, to myself, I say, tell them that. You're not telling them what the, why you're doing that. You're just doing it, but not why. And I tear my hair out. <laughs> Give me that camera, I'll tell them. <laughs> Anyways, well, of course, you can see I'm varying the colors and I'm varying the sizes of the evergreen trees big time. Okay, I think we're sort of made, like made the point on that one, correct? Uh, just, well, Janelle, um, is asking, Janelle is asking, are all soft edges muted value and tone? No. You want to say what a soft edge is? It, it's, you can tell. It, look, um, here, I'll, I'll show you in the painting. Uh, right now, I just want to show you a little bit of uh, negative painting here. That's a really neat thing. You have to learn negative painting when it comes to watercolor. You have no other way out. So what I'm doing is I'm creating the indentations on those evergreen trees. Look how I use the corner of the brush. Because actually a three-quarter or one-half inch brush watercolor can take on many forms. If you use the tip, you got probably number six round. If you use the tip, you got um, like the very edge, you got a chisel edge, which is probably like a number two rigger brush. So I don't really have to be changing brushes that much. All the paint along courses are recorded live. Um, they're they're done live and they're streamlined and then they're recorded uh, to, that you can download. Okay, here's the finished painting. Let's let's zoom in here so you can see what we're talking about. Uh, several questions on what is negative painting. Okay, let's go through it. Okay, so you can see here this little play. It's a little play where you have a little touch of a hard edge there, hard edge there, and then all this becomes soft edged. Same thing here. So I allow the eye to come into focus here and there, and then we lose the focus, and that, that creates a very relaxed viewpoint. Look, for example, this little evergreen tree is a good example. We get soft edged over here, and then suddenly we bring this into focus. That's called the principle of contrasts. And here the negative painting is, I want to make this look 3D. So what I do is I, I cut in to these bushes here using a darker color. And these are abstract shapes. And here it's just a mild there because it's further back. So we have a very interesting play of evergreen trees with various colors and different shapes and different... Um, edges, right? I, I was very happy with this painting. And here's here's up just to make my point. This would be a tree in watercolor done without soft edges, without the lost and found. Do you see how it looks somewhat fake and it looks two dimensional? It doesn't seem like it's round, like it's cut out and pasted on. And the idea is that by do by implementing this technique. You see how the uh, tree seems to go round. So, for instance, over here, oops. here, this segment of the foliage seems to come closer to you, and then this tends to go back. It recedes. 
see the illusion there because it's soft edged. So that's right there. That's a that's a typical example of a tree that has the the spot wetting lost and found edges. In fact, I should add that here to my. Um, I'm going to add that so you can remember it. So this PDF will be yours if is this. Ah, uh, wait, wait, dude! I, I can't, can't I, I can't because uh maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, yes, I can. It's got 4.5 gigas. Yeah, I can upload it. Correct, you're correct. Okay. So here's another. No, so it's correct. Was asked. Go ahead. Oh, okay, let's. We will give you this PDF that you can download if you sign up for the course that's starting day after tomorrow. We'll add it on to your, your products there. How's that? It's got all the demos for you. Sound tempting? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. They don't need it. They have it on YouTube. There's no point to it. There's no oh, need. It's true. gonna. It remains perpetually on YouTube. There's no point. Okay. Yeah, some several have asked about YouTube is always available yeah. to you unless it's taken down. This will not be taken down. Yeah. Anyway, so um, here now it's I I I can't promise it download on, on Artist Network. We don't need it. We got it on YouTube. That was for the paint along courses. Okay, here's another example of evergreen trees that are hard edged. They look like they're pasted on, and then look at this. See it much easier on the eye. Okay. Go ahead, Jude. Sorry. Someone was asking if watercolor is always adding darks to do negative painting. Yes. Yes and no. Uh, and and watercolor, yeah. Watercolor, you yeah. Watercolor, yeah. Negative painting is up. Out. Go ahead. You can also take out the paint negatively and show and do it through negative painting by taking out, wiping out. Yeah, as a resource of um, when you have to. You Obviously, the idea is to avoid that because it sort of like damages the paper. Here's another example where you have lost and found edges, where some areas you focus and some you don't. And then everything in the background is completely wet on wet. And you can see here on the seascape, same thing. This comes into focus and this is out of focus. It, so it actually feels like the water is moving. See, the eye does not enjoy everything soft edge and neither does it enjoy everything hard edge. So it's that, it's that play between the both. Okay, let's go on the next one. Soften edges. How to soften edges on a dry surface. Okay. Snow banks and darkening areas and foliage. Let's see what this video is going to show us. So you add the paint there, and that's too, that's too um, hard-edged because obviously snow is round, roundish like a pillow. So how do you make that pillowy? You drag a wet brush on top of that, so it just spreads into the rest of the, the roof there. And that was the demo. <laughs> Did you catch it? Because if you blinked, you lost it. You can always go back. <laughs> uh, here's the application, for example. All the, by the way, all these paintings were done live in class. None of them were done in my studio separately. All live demos. Where did I get here? Draw. Okay, so you can so see. So once again, lost and found is in reference to edges, especially when you're doing the contour of something. Okay, you can see there the, the how that it looks like a pillow, darker underneath and round at the top, and that's great for snow scenes. Uh, color variegation. That's the first lesson I learned. It's everywhere. <laughs> uh, the thing is, since you're trying to create the impact of a landscape that people would normally see the size of Central Park in New York City, like huge mountains and three-story tall trees, and, and then you got to bring that down to 11 by 14 can, uh, paper or 12 by 16, um, it's going to degrade that in massiveness of nature a lot. So we need to find techniques where, since we can't create the large forms of nature unless you go to an IMAX theater and you have permission to paint on the screen, uh, you can't fake it. So 
what we got to do is add on to what nature doesn't give you. So nature has boring colors, monochromatic colors, and very gray colors, like the grays and rocks and, and tree trunks. So we can make up for the lack of size with the beauty of color. So there's a technique where, for example, if you look at the rocks here, uh, they have just so much variation of color. Uh, you would never see rocks with purples and oranges and blues and, and, and reds all together in one rock. Usually they're just, you know, boring, uh, boring flat gray. So we got a little video here for you. So don't, don't, uh, don't snooze off anybody because th that was five seconds, the other one. <laughs> well, not maybe five seconds, but pretty fast. So here, here's the trick. Watercolor always needs technique. The first thing you do is you take the paint out from the, the wells and you make little pools as you see me doing. You know, this, this is a huge secret right here. This is a huge secret um, for watercolor. You don't, this is, this is what happens on the, it's more important what happens on the palette than what actually happens on the, on the paper. So you can see, I just swooshed them together a little bit. Just, just like, like marbled ceramic tile. That's it. All those colors are inside the brush already. And then they should just come right off. So stroke, load, look at the palette, stroke, load. Come on, Joe, load. <laughs> Since when would you think about putting reds in a rock, right? This is an important segment of the, of the, of the workshop that I'm giving right now. Throw some cerulean blue in there. As you can see, I'm not mixing the colors on the palette. That's the secret. I just mingle them a little bit together. But do not mix your colors on the palette. Look at those fast and furious brush strokes. Love it. You mix them on. You mix the colors right on the paper. Let them just. They will just bleed together a little bit more. But yet, the different variations of them will stand out. This is called letting your paint do the work. Looks like fun, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I love it. I remember this one. Yeah, it was quite recent, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. I was just like, I think it was in November I gave, I did this with you guys. Look at this. There's no fear. No fear. Well, again, what I can teach you, if I teach you the step-by-step, -step, the techniques to do things, and you see it being done, then you also will not have fear. The thing is, you, need, you want the training. I mean, my hand's not going to do anything different than yours. Except experience, but it's not going to, I mean, what I'm doing, anybody can do. They just have to be shown how. So it gives you that confidence. The reason that I'm so loose at the brushstroke is because you get the confidence to say, okay, this is the technique, step by step. Do not overmix your colors on the palette. You can still see they're all identifiable. Pretty much Puritan as they are in the palette. And throw them a little bit and mingle, just mix them a little bit on the can, on the paper, but almost nothing. I'm going to let this one play all the way through because I think it's important. Even the purple's in there. Okay, and this this is the end result. Then I went back in and I negative painted in the rocks. I added the sides to them. I darkened them, added the water. So that was just the, the preliminary way to apply the paint. Uh, the same thing happened here. You can see clearly. Uh, yeah, I'll try to get my drawing tools here. There we go. You can see a little touch of yellow ochre there. I mean, raw sienna. Then we have a little bit of purple in there. More raw sienna over here. And so the trick is, instead of putting to a point too much color on top of each other, you juxtapose, like putting ceramic tiles, one beside the other, beside the other, beside the other. And that gives you those lovely colors. And that's what watercolor is known for, is to... So look at this; these warm colors in the foreground there. 
So, so much for snow being blue, correct? It isn't really blue in paintings. You can see the, and these rocks too, a little bit more conservative than what you just saw because they're in the shadow. But you can clearly see the shifts of um, from the purple. Look at the beautiful purple color there. A little bit of gray. It's okay because you don't want it to look like they're, they're um, fruit gels either or jelly beans. Then we went from the purple. Gradually we went to the warmer orange. But this, this little play here is is what watercolor is all about. Even here in this evergreen tree, you can see um, it, the shifting from the green and it works its way into the reddish tone. Now again, a lot of pros do this naturally, but it needs to be really emphasized. And this painting, well, we, it's pretty clear what I did with those rocks, right? So it, it adds so much life to your paintings instead of just painting those gray, boring rocks. And incidentally, great rhythm in this. what's that? Great rhythm in those yeah. rocks. And here's the trick where we have lost and found edges. This one here is soft against a harder edge. You can clearly see that here. Soft. And then it picks up to be hard edged here. That the, the very fact that you soften an edge casts the second portion of the foliage further back. That's the loot. That's how you do it. You'll never see that in the photograph, and you're never going to see that when you're looking at plein air. It only happens in paintings, which is a whole. It's I call it the narrative landscape versus the literal landscape. Okay, dry brushing. One of my favorite techniques where you break up the paint. So for broken foliage, it's absolutely beautiful. Like for um, trees that are bare trees that don't have any leaves on them. Uh, you can create the illusion of tree bark by dry brushing on that. If, for close-up, I wouldn't do it for the ones that are further back because it gets too busy. Texture on rocks, which I did over here. There's a little bit of dry brushing there just to make it look granular. Weathered wood, like on barns. Uh, you Here, you can see that example there. Look at this little lovely effect in there. It makes the, the wood look like it's old and weathered. For example, this watercolor has no sense of realism whatsoever, right? Finally, I got liberated from that. Tremendous water color variegation in this area there. Tremendous color variegation in here. That's what enriches the, the, your watercolors. And then you can see the dry brush effect here on that tree trunk. Let's see how we do it with the video. How do you do it without getting your colors on, Letty Joe? Uh, the dry brushing really doesn't matter because that's just a, that's an overlayer on something that's already uh, pre-toned with the color variegation. And then you just add a little bit of dry brushing on top. So that, does, that doesn't but matter. Uh, for example, if I go... How do you achieve that when you're doing your color variegation? You don't. Here, for example, in this... Let me go back here. All right. Oh, there he is. You got to do this keys in a good Yes, sir. That kind of fits into my question. How does he avoid getting green when he's combining yellow okay. and blue? Okay, so this. That's the mudding and the clouding of colors. Isn't it, isn't it neat to have these live videos because you can ask the question right on the spot? Okay, if you look carefully here, I, I, I would not enjoy doing recorded videos, to be honest. It, I need to have the interaction. It, you you stimulate me. Um, there's no equal to that. Okay. Anyway, I what I did first is I laid in the cobalt blue here with the burnt sienna, and then add a little bit of permanent rose to get that color variation. Correct. And then once that was dry, that's where I took the brush with very little paint on it and just made the paint look rugged by dry brushing on it. But that doesn't matter if it's. Uh, if it's monochromatic, because it's you're, you're just it's just little bits and pieces. You're seeing all the color variation under it. And once okay, again, so how do you how do you apply the colors one next to another? And join, my <laughs> join my classes. Join my classes. Which, by the way, 
Uh, they start day after tomorrow, but they run every month of the year, the, mostly the first Saturday of each month. And uh, now that I'm going to bring this up, a little bit of a commercial break here. Um, if you compare the prices, you'll never find it anywhere else. Uh, what do you think about 15 hours of class? You can already see the quality of instruction for $24.99 US. Three Saturdays for $24.99. Five hours each Saturday. Does that sound like a deal? However, there's a little kicker to that. Um, in order to stay with inflation, Artist Network will raise the prices to $26.99, except if you sign up today for the class that starts day after tomorrow, which is, I'll, I'll promote that later on. So you got until today, midnight, uh, to pay $24.99. Then it goes to $26.99. Okay, so join my classes. <laughs> I can't go through everything in a in a short video. Okay, let's do a little bit of a. And you do not need to join um, Artist Network membership. Um, those courses are not included in that. These are a little bit separate. Yeah, just you only have you only have to pay twenty six nine twenty four ninety nine today and twenty six ninety nine. And you get three oh. workshops in one. Yes, the, they are paint along if you wish to, Helene. Most people watch the first time and then uh, on the recording paint with it so that they can stop the recording and paint and then watch how Joe st does the next step and then do that step. Or you can just do bits and pieces. Yeah, the classes are paint along. And if you're new to art or feel that you're a beginner, don't get discouraged with his classes as being very complex. He's um, gearing these classes to all mediums, to all mediums and all levels. Just take pieces of it and work slowly through it. Yeah, if you're if you're like emerging, I can point out and I'd say, I would like you to copy this, this symbol here. Don't worry about the rest. It's too, too challenging. Like, for example, what I'm doing now, there's, there's a, the technique, the dry brushing. What I'm doing now, you can do that on a separate sheet of paper yourself and don't worry about all the rest of the houses and all that. But if you learn these symbols, see, now I'm doing, look at the technique for dry brushing. How oddly or awkwardly, actually, I should say, I'm holding that brush the opposite way and pushing down. And I curve it up a little bit too, by the way. So I, I, what I'm creating here is the illusion of semi-bare trees with a little bit of foliage on them. I'll speed it up a little bit. I never have enough time. I'll do a time. Oh, look at that. There it is. Oh, no, you got, I, you know, I want you to see that stroke. There it is. Oh, come on, play. Uh-oh, don't crash on me. There it is. Yeah, I'm just I'm just showing you excerpts, right, of how to do it. So here's the finished painting. There you can see all the dry brush. You know where you can really see the dry brushing? Here. Big time. All those look like little leaves that are changed color. They're grayish brown now. You can also see the dry brushing here on top of the tree trunk. And here, I was happy with this little guy over here. So again, we have a, what is called the principle of contrast. That is, I know that some of you here are, so I think I have some top pros in right now listening to me. Uh, because I belong to FASO, which is a uh, hosts 70,000 artists. And a lot of the top pros hang out, not hang out, they host their websites there. So they got the invitation. 70,000, because I, I, I got an insert there in their workshop, um, News Blast. So some of you I know, you're, 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 you don't have to give your names, but I know you're listening to this class right now. And I can tell you one thing, I have something to offer you 
even though you are a very advanced and successful artist, there's one concept that I want to teach you. And it's called the principle of contrasts. And if you are um, eager enough to learn that, it will even take you to a further level than what you already are. And I'll just give a little bit of a bait here. If you look at this symbol here, remember I'm calling it a symbol. The trick is, part of, one of the principles of contrast is you always do comparisons that are juxtaposed. So here, for instance, we have a dry brush effect which shows texture, but here we don't. That's the secret. For a, for a symbol to look more appealing, you do the yes and then, then you do the no. The yin and the yang. Dry brushing on one part, no dry, a solid form on another part. That creates a very beautiful form. Instead of, oh, everything is hard edge or everything is soft edge or everything has texture or everything is flat. And it brings your paintings up to another notch. Okay, so what do we got here? Oh, we got another demo here on dry brushing. Okay, here we go. Um, Munch, Munchkin, setting the paper is so it doesn't buckle. So you put it in a sink or a bathtub to soak for a few minutes, take it out, and then stretch it either in a watercolor gator board, gorilla board, or in uh, with tape on a board. Well, we'll talk about setting the paper in a few minutes. Give us a moment while Joe does his demo. For me, the, the, there's nothing like the Gatorade, the Gatorade, <laughs> the Gorilla watercolor <laughs> board. I'm thirsty, yeah, you can tell. The, the Gorilla yeah. watercolor board is, you say goodbye to buckling forever. See, now there, here the trick is to do the dry brush. You have not a lot of paint on your brush and you need to move it fast. You have to like, boom, like step on the accelerator to get that effect there. But you can, you can do, um, you can Google setting watercolor paper. There's several um, demos out there that are very good. See, that broken up effect is what watercolor, in my view, should be one of the add-ons that you want there. Okay, so, oh, Jude, this is what you were asking about earlier. Boom. What is that? The dry brushing. No, I was asking about how you avoid um, mud. Well, mixing with you're, you know how you avoid it? Because every another. every color that appears on your palette should be identifiable. So I showed you that you don't mix colors on the palette. First of all, you don't want to use pigments that are too garish or too saturated because then you're forced to mix them. So there's a set of pigments that already are somewhat grayed down. For example, raw sienna is somewhat grayed down. So you can use that right out of the tube. Or burnt sienna is another one. But... And early, if you go back to the YouTube video, I showed that where you put the pools of paint on your palette, but you don't mix them. You just mingle them a little bit, and that's it. You, you should always see the colors. Here's another principle of contrast, folks. You do more dry brushing on the front part. Okay, here's another one. Gradient plane. Oh, I'm giving it away. I'm giving so much away right now, Jude. I know, I know. You are so kind, Joe. You're one of the kindest art pro odor artists I know. You really are. Yeah, watercolor blocks do work constants. I like them, but some of them have a lot of setting in them, and I get mixed results. Um, but there are ways to set your paper without using just the blocks or the Gorilla Board, which is not inexpensive. Here's another one. One, another principle contrast called the gradient plane. Never spoken about, very rarely applied. If you want to create the illusion that this side of the building is receding, you start darker in the front, lighter at the back. And then you variegate the colors from one, one color here to another color there. 
That's the lovely effect called the gradient plane. If you put it all one value, it then it seems like it's two dimensional. It doesn't seem like that part of the building recedes. It goes further back. You can also see it here where it's lighter here, but that would be this would be logical. And then darker as you go deeper in. But that's logical because you get that's a different I mean anybody would know that. But look at just look at the amount of color shifts. You're never going to see wood like this in real life. It absolutely does not exist. But in paintings, it works so well, doesn't it? But Sarah keeps asking, and let's see if we can address this. Definitely. How do you mingle blue and yellow without getting that? Ah, uh, well, that would be different. Yeah. So if you're going to pull out a Prussian blue and you want like a toned down green, and then you use raw sienna, yeah, then you're going to have to mix them. But you don't still have to mix them 100% because you can allow a little bit of that blue to show through. But yeah, you're going to have to do more than just intermingling it very lightly. Yeah, now that's a color mixture because you're not you're not using a pre-fabricated uh, green. Uh, Mary, these the narrative world. And by the way, Mary, I've known you for such a long time. Welcome to see you back. I've known Mary for since two thousand and eight. Can you believe that? I've known her since two thousand and eight. But that's um, a long time. yeah, I know. Um, the more you leave the logic of the outdoors alone, leave it out, and the more you immerse into the narrative world of landscape painting, which has its own principles, it's, it's like a dream. It has its own reality. And the more you, you immerse into that new world, the narrative world, the better you will be. We don't have to worry about all the logic and things like that. As long as you don't, you know, grotesquely contradict it. Okay, let's do a flat wash. Uh, Mary, oh, when I was, it. when I taught you um, in Edmonton, when I lived there, I know so much more now, my dear, than then. So much more. It's the amount of information that I have is doubled. Uh, and it should be after so many years. So you're, hear, you're hearing things that you didn't hear with me when we were in Edmonton together. Big revelations. LJ is asking about uh, dry brushing. What is it? It's, uh, well, when you go back here, it's just, you very gently, here, I'll show you again against, the idea is to, dry brushing is to break up the paint. Okay, it sort of like freezes on me. Good thing is it doesn't crash. Okay, again, look at the building here. What did I do? Okay, we'll do it on this side. Wait. Well, it's exaggerated on the tree. Let's go back to the tree. Maybe you stepped away a little bit. Okay, look there what I'm doing. At the right-hand side, you probably missed it. It was off the, it was off the uh, screen. You got like a damp brush. It doesn't have a lot of paint on it. And you hit the, the paper very quickly. That's a secret. You have to move the brush really fast and it breaks up and it creates a texture like bark or weathered wood or for rocks. It's a, it's a, and it's an excellent technique. A gravel on a dry... Oh, I do have that here. The gravel on, the, um, on a driveway, for example. In fact, I should add that here. Oh, I did. Oh, I underestimated myself. Gravel road. So let me zoom in here. So I zoom out so you can see this. There's a lot of principle and contrast in this painting, by the way. See the little dry brush here? Just a tad. You don't want to overdo it. That looks like it's gravel stones. It creates that illusion. Okay, flat wash. This is pretty simple. Uh, I don't even know if I have to show a demo on this. You know what? I'll go back to it so, because it's pretty obvious. I just wanted to include it in there. Okay, background effects, splattering, saran wrap, salt. That's more for flowers. We can go back to that later according to time. Uh, scraping. This is better here. Let's do this one. Scraping with a credit card or palette knife. So that has an app. Just remind me those two, um, those two slides there, Jude. You have to... I'm so carried away. If you can just write it down somewhere so I don't forget them. 
slide 29 and 32. Just I don't want to go way past the time. So, okay. So here. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. here the, the the application is texture on rocks, tree bark, and stucco walls. Uh, let's do that. Here we got a little video for that. I love these little videos because that's how people learn, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Pat, it's it's coming up. He's got just the uh, the presentation up. It will come up in just a sec. Okay, there. Oh, there. There goes your question, Jude, about laying on colors. There we go. We're gonna have a really good example here. Look at the palette. All the colors are identifiable. They're a little bit intermixed. Maybe I grab maybe two or three at the same time. That's possible too. It's a matter of so uh, on your brush, you grab several also, at a time. Yeah, also you it depends what color it is, but sometimes you double load your brush as well. Yeah, I see that. There the water the gorilla watercolor boards come in three sizes, full page, half page, and a quarter page. A quarter page doesn't work because it, it the bars take away too much of your real estate. So I don't use that. The half the half uh sheet is perfect. That's what I paint on for my demos. See, so look at you can identify all those colors in that one rock. That's another principle of contrasts. Every I have a habit that every inch and a half this is good this, you want to have this information watercolorists. Every inch and a half or so on a 12 by 16 paper my policy is to shift the color but lazily gradually not abrupt and one way to develop a habit is that every time you reach the palette make sure you grab a different color so if you apply to let's say burnt sienna and you go back then grab the uh, cobalt blue like as you can see i just did right now you don't have to wipe your brush because you want some of that to gray down anyway See, look at all those lovely colors on that rock symbol. And I just lifted the paint there to create mist. See, there's no mud whatsoever on that rock. I'm going to show the whole video. It's only a few minutes. I think this is an important one. Yeah, those rocks, rocks, abstract <laughs> shapes. We don't see any dinosaur eggs in here. Even though every now and then to put that amongst carved out rugged, um, angular rocks is a good policy because you get the principal contrast, I, again, even principal contrast of shapes against shapes. Because if they're all angular, you don't have the principal contrasts. Oh, yeah, true. True, true. That principal contrast, those 10 points in the principal contrast is the holy grail of art here comes the water here comes the credit card yeah i love that this is really cool so what the card does is it takes some of the highlights some of the paint away yeah and it, and it adds whatever stuck to the paper becomes a texture you got to hit that just at the right spot to the paper has to lose its she its sheen so it has to be damp not wet. If it's too wet, it's just going to go right back in again. So you got it's it's a lot it takes a practice to to get it just right. Yes, yeah, Susan, you can join the paint alongs at any time. Um, the the but we encourage you to watch all of them, even if you don't paint along or even if you don't paint in that medium, because we are giving out tips on um, color, on color harmony, on a composition on lines on shapes there is so much knowledge in there other than just the medium that's being used um yeah it join that uh, watch all the three saturdays in that course obviously maybe some people can't join all the paint alongs i've given 107 by now well 106 plus the breakthroughs see look how cool that effect is with the brushes I have a, a Mexican a discount car there. That's, that's, I painted in Mexico, I painted in the States, in Canada, you name it. What frame 
screen size did you use for a 12 by 16 sheet you painted on? 12 by six, well, 12 by 16, a little bit bigger if you want it. Well, watercolors tend to have a, a liner, a mat, sorry. They look better with mat, so you got to go a little bit bigger than that. Usually those are custom made. If you don't want the mat, then you can buy a 12 by 16 in Michael's or other stores. But you can see how the, you can see how the paint is so, still damp, but it's not soaking wet. So in, that, in this case, it becomes very cooperative. Yeah, that was happy. Yeah, Mary, you can get Joe's um, palette off his website. I'll put the website in again for you. But his specific palette is in there for watercolors. He uses two different types of watercolors: Winsor Newton and also Graham. Well, there you can see that's Laguna Beach, California. Robin, I put, by the way, we have a a, a very, a, a, a student pet, we can say to her. Uh, lots of admiration because her name is Robin. I don't know if she's with us. Don't, I hope you don't make me look bad. You're not there, Robin. But she lives she's in Australia. Here. She's here always. She lives yeah, in Australia. Sure. Okay. She lives in Australia and she doesn't go to bed. So she can watch the class at at three o'clock in the morning her time, and she's done that religiously for years. So we are, we're very uh, like she's our pet. I, I hope you don't take that the wrong way. But like the teacher's pet from that perspective, because it's you know that kind of dedication. Okay, so lifting and scrubbing. It's an easy technique. Karen is asked have you. Karen has asked, have you ever tried to use a scraping in oils? No, it doesn't card? work. It doesn't work, unfortunately. I would love to do it because I love the effect, but I've tried. It doesn't work. Maybe if there's paint underneath it, that could be a technique I haven't tried, that you paint something under it, and then you go on top and you scrape it off. It just dawned on me that that's possible. Okay, so lifting and scrubbing. We're going back to this painting. Let's see, where. what did I do here to make that work? Oh yeah, to make a correction, use some paint. Use painter's tape, by the way. Don't use masking tape because it rips the paper. Oops, what did I do there? Sorry. Trigger happy. Don't you crash on me. There you go. Uh, okay, where are we now? Yeah, here it is. Huh? Can't play this. Oh, I see. I got something here. Okay, so. I forgot to put the reflected light at the bottom. So use painter's tape. Every now and then I put my I stick my head in the camera to see if I'm losing hair. That's the only way I can tell at the top, so you gotta check that out every now and then. Okay, so right now what I'm doing is I'm using a, you can use a sponge. A magic eraser works really well to lift out paint. So that's a lifting out technique. It's good for tree trunks too, but you don't need to, you don't need the, the tape, the painter's tape for that. You can just wet it and run a, a napkin over it or paper towel. There you go, see? And then you can paint over that. And that's how I did these trees back there in this vignette. These over here, that was a lifting out technique. Uh, here, Mary planning, you can see this is a typical example of a narrative world that's got nothing to do with the real world. There's nothing realistic in here whatsoever. In fact, pursuing realism in watercolor is it just sets people back. I, I don't think there's any worse teaching that you can do than to take a photograph, analyze the photograph, and then teach the students how to copy those elements in the photograph. 
because now they're not going to get into the narrative symbols. So um, I lifted out the paint. All, as you can see, nothing. there's no realism in this whatsoever. It's a whole new world. I mean, those the foliage back there don't even doesn't even look like foliage, but it convinces you that it is. Wait, I'm, 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 no, Mary, I'm confusing you with another student in Edmonton. You weren't in Edmonton. I met you in in California. Sorry, I, I got the time long wrong. Still goes back quite a few years, but I'm confusing you with someone else. Let me correct that. <laughs> I remember now. It's just the timeline was wrong. Um, bulky texture. Now, where am I with this here? Protruding foliage clusters, texture on rocks and stucco. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's adding. That's something that I've never seen before. I, I, I think I invented it, to be honest. You take um, watercolor ground. It's a white paste, like toothpaste. And you spread it on. To create texture, just like oils, but still you get the beauty of watercolor. And so you can see that there's, um, it becomes bulky. Let's see how the video works. Look at that, I'm spreading that with a palette knife. You never think that I'm not going to do a watercolor on that, do you? Yeah, I confused the Marys. Now, watercolorists, you have not seen this before. I can guarantee you that. Unless you've been my student, you've never seen this before. So now you're, what? What? Uh, I've never laughing. seen. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing. You just never know what this guy's going to pull out from under his sleeve. <laughs> I think uh, that's just... That's why so many of us have been with Joe for so long. There is always something new. Always. So I'm glad to see you here, Jay. We're glad you made it, honey. Yeah, we're like a big family. We have hundreds and hundreds. Ah, the reason why I know, you know what? That fee, twenty four ninety nine. Doesn't it sound yeah. suspiciously low? Like, boy, if I buy a pair of running shoes at that price, I don't think they're good. Or if I go to a restaurant and spend $24 on two people on a meal, that must be a lousy restaurant. So honestly, it could even seem like it backfires to have it that low. But you know what the difference is? Artist Network is the leader of education of fine art that goes back decades before any other people started. And... The, the, the amount of hundreds and hundreds of students allows us to charge that. Now, if you look at the Artist Network subscribers, n there's no other organization that gives art demos on YouTube that I've seen that can reach even close to 312,000 subscribers. See that at the bottom left? And you know why? Because they publish magazines, and they used to publish the Northlight books. So they've been out there a long time. So all these magazines that you go to stores... All the art magazines, not all of them, but about, I have to count them, but there are about four or five art magazines on the racks. Ooh, watch, watch these brush strokes. Say to, I hate to interrupt Joe, but this is so good. So good. That's the Look shoving, that. that's the dry brushing technique. And, and of course we want lost and found, correct? That's why I wet that. Belly, belly painting, one more time. So good. Let the brush do your work. <laughs> Mike, Mike is suspicious. Are you kidding me, Mike? You don't miss a course. Well, all I can say is if you're new with us today, why not give us a try? Come for these next three webinars of this next session. Page is $24.99 and just give us a try. Look what Mary type. Joe, what? Joe washes the washes. Joe moves the watercolor brush. That's not normal. <laughs> she calls it. <laughs> yeah, aren't you glad, Mary? You're not his brush. 
pit against the bristles. It's so it's awkward, isn't it? But you know what? Try it. You might say, "Wow, look! It's not difficult to produce a, a, a foliage like this. It just takes some training. It's not difficult at all. You get the step by step. You can do it. And they, and if your if your eyes are open, say, "Well, I need principle of contrast, and I need some." Here's a principle of contrast right there. We got on on the left hand side of the tree, we have broken up paint. On the right hand side, we don't. So you contrast those two. And Joe always says, don't judge your tree until until you get in your branches and your trunk. Here's somebody asked how to do a uh, bush. Here we go. Here we go. I promised it would come up. Oh, so you follow the clock. To look at the Just side of the wait, brush. Sarah. Just wait, Sarah. It, it does, if you notice, the paint is not as, as saturated in the area where the ground was. So well, it's like it comes forward. Honestly, Jude, the point is it's, it's chalky there because I didn't give it time to dry. Because we were in the midst of a oh. class and I didn't want it to drag on, but you should let it dry first, so that you can see um, this part here. Uh, yeah, but you can see this is correct here. I think this part dried over there, so that looks lovely. Over here, you see a little chunk there, like a little um, scab. Then that, that seems to come forward. So it, it is a very useful technique. Let me see, I didn't finish this video, so let me see, what am I missing here? It was, it was longer. Oh, the, yeah, like you said, you don't, um, don't judge your trees until you put the tree branches in. And there's a technique for that too. I purposely create large gaps in my trees to give it a loose, airy feeling. And I take advantage of those areas to add the tree trunks. Okay, I got the, there we go. There you go. So you can use the brush. As you can see, I practically use the same brush for everything. Little tip there. And then I'm dragging left to right to get the thicker tree trunk. In the paint along courses, you can download the course and store it on an external hard drive, which you should always do anyway. All the, all the demos are downloadable. I think my students have terabytes and terabytes of, of courses, don't they? See, now I'm using a tapping technique to create those tree branches. And I'm checking the negative space, the white space in between each branch to make sure I'm not repeating them. So you can use the very tip and create a thin line. Chisel edge, chisel edge gets you a really hairline, a thin hairline branch there. That's called a chisel edge. Tap, tap, tap. Okay, what else do I have here? I got more goodies. Oh, there's a negative paint. Okay, let's see that. I think we're doing okay with time. Munchkin is asking for dry brush. Is the um, paint the consistency of tea, milk, or cream? Tea? Neither. A cream is still too thick. I mean, too thin. Too thin. Yogurt for the dry brushing. Like loose yogurt, not not the, not the thick one, not the Greek yogurt, the looser one. Yeah, it would be actually be a good idea that you know what, dude. Next time I give, I'm gonna bring down a little bit of yogurt, yogurt, put my brush in there, and then do some dry brushing to see if that's true. But that's oh, a great okay, question. Cool. Yeah, that is a good question. But I think it's more important that it be done on dry on dry, so your brush is dry. And the right. paper is dry. No, no, the paper is dry, but there's a little bit of moisture in the brush because otherwise, how do you get it on? But it's very little. Yeah, very little is key. Yep. 
Now I'm what I'm doing is called 3Ding. That's a verb that I made up. Put that in quotation marks, which means I I have a um, an obsession to create three dimensional objects in my painting so they look round, and they look more believable. I rarely use the word real. I like believable, convincing, like a water call, waterfall can be convincing, believable, but I do not like to use the word real. Because now you're, you're, now you're trying to compare it to the literal world rather than the narrative world. If you really think about it, that's not a tree, right? Nowhere in nature are you going to see a figure that looks like that. It's all composed of many, many thousands of leaves. But you're creating a symbol. And the more you get into the world of symbols rather than realism, the better. So all the, land, all the success in landscape painting, regardless of the medium, is in the development of the symbols. And so you have to relearn it all. Instead of copying photographs, instead of copying nature, even plein air painting, what you do is you learn landscape symbols. And that's where you're going to make the jump. I rent, if I showed you my first tree, you guys would laugh. It was that pursuit of trying to copy a tree and its realism. Okay, so we'll, well, I don't have to show you the chisel edge. Well, okay, I did show you the chisel edge brush stroke, but I'll, there's another variation here. Okay, thin lines that you just saw me do. Twigs, fence posts, crack and barn wood. Close-up palm tree fawns. I'll, I, my demo here has the palm trees. That's coming from this painting, by the way. So how do you create all those fawns? And here we go. That's a fun way to do it. Boom, 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 boom. So you can create little lines like that. Oh, oh, guys. Look at those two trees behind that one. You can... You can really see the lost and found edges on that. Some of it bleeds. Some of it comes into focus. I can't think of a better example of um, a principle of contrast than that tr That second. Okay, you can see the, three tree, the two trees in the background. The one that's further back has very little hard edges. It's more bled out. The one that's closer, the one that's between the one I'm painting now and the one that's further back, now we're picking up on a little bit more focus. Nevertheless, we still have wet on wet. It's such a pleasing symbol to look at. Another advantage of creating soft edges, especially with palm trees, it's because the fawns are moving with the wind rather than just being static. That's a great way to show depth, too. Yeah, because the one that's hard-edged is coming forward. Now, you can grab, you can actually reach out with your hand and grab it, grab the that um, palm tree, especially if you put it right in yep. front, like what I'm doing right now, that hard edge versus a soft edge. And, of course, warmer versus cooler, darker versus lighter. And look how, when I load my brush, you can see I go for a little bit of a brown mixture, then I go back for the the green mixer, back to the brown, two greens, one brown, two browns, three greens, etc. randomly. I think the chat stays, Helen. They don't they don't eliminate the chat from YouTube, I believe, I'm not sure. Okay. And what do we have at the bottom of that cloud, Jude? But we're not going to say what it's all about because you got to join the courses. Melodic oh, line. Oh, it's a very specific line. So that's, there's two very, very big treasures that, I, again, professionals, you're going to need that. Sorry if I sound arrogant about it, but you might say, ah, this guy thinks he knows what he's talking about. Once you see it, you're going to say, oh my gosh, yes. That is something that I didn't know. I can guarantee that. No matter how good you are, sorry if I say that. I'm very self-confident because these principles are infallible. And it's not about me. It's about the principles. I'm not trying to 
show myself off and talking about the principles are are important and it's one of that is the principal contrast and the second one is the musical lines visual music okay this is a technique that I, I had to invent a way to create um, frosted trees it's hard to do that with it can do it very easily with water with oils you just dry brush the paint on top but I figured out a way so let's see how we did it it's using a sea sponge well, the problem with what you said earlier, Joe, is many of the pros do not give away their secret. They say, I'm going to put blue in this area now, and you do not do that in your workshop. You give the reason for why you were doing what you were doing and what the principle is. Very different. Very different from most of the pros out there giving us webinars these days. Well, well, like, well, once again, I, it's the principles that work. It's really not about me. It's about the knowledge that, that the knowledge exists. It just has to be mentioned. And they do, yeah. they do apply them. I mean, there's many very good artists out there, but it's the, when you verbalize it, it makes it so much clearer for the students. So right. there you go, guys. I'm All making right. frosted trees. A bright is a not as long as a flat, uh, Willen. That's right. You answered it. Yeah, correctly. that's very effective. That sea sponge is very effective with that. It's kind of a form of negative painting almost. It is. Well, it is 100%. You're just not drawing it in. Look at the... Um, the variegation of the snow at the bottom. Try to get that out of a real world. Or a photograph or plein air painting. Look at the transitions between the yellow, especially where the, um, in the middle part of the painting. You got the yellows and you got the pinks and you got the blues in there. That's what watercolor is all about. And oils. Or whatever. Yeah, you, the you, lady's you, asking how... How thick is the paint on that sponge? Uh, it doesn't. You make a puddle. It's got a. You know, you'll, you'll start to do by trial and error. If you pounce on it, and it doesn't, it creates too many um, close gaps. Then you know it, it's too wet. It's got to break up into a way that's. You know, you got some breaking up, which I got. So you just add more water or more paint to you. you by trial and error, you'll figure it out. It's not. That's not difficult. It's just knowing how, what tool to do it is what does the job. Okay, so I don't have to put all the branches. And there you go. That's the finished painting. Rigger brush. All right, let's do that. That's pretty straightforward. So that's good for thin lines such as wire and tree twigs. We're, make, we're making good progress here. Helene, he couldn't use a flat brush in, 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 to do that application. He just couldn't do it. No. It would be too many little dots, and he yeah. doesn't like doing Oh, you mean to take like a round brush and poke away, you know, peck away at it? Yeah. Like a yeah. bird look, yeah. pecking yeah. at it. Oh, no, that's going to create a that's going to create a lack of randomness. Yep. Okay. Now, here's this video. This is Central Park. I did this during a breakthrough. All these, again, are their live classes. The trick to make the rigger brush work correctly is you got to grab it at the end or at least higher up, and then flick it. That's the round brush. That's not the thin one. And I'm moving it very quickly because I want the paint to break up a little bit so it looks barky, not solid lines like when you're writing a, a, a word on a piece of paper. So the faster you move the brush, the better to break up that paint. There you can see a little bit of dry brushing at the top. That's what you want. Central Park and watercolor. Oh, 
Uh, you can go both ways. You can start from the top to the bottom and you can go from the bottom up. Sometimes it's much more comfortable to start from the top and work your way down. And again, you have to flick that very quickly. Once you get into the thin branches, that's where you're going to have to flick it. There we go. We're flicking it now. No solid forms. Did you note that there's some, on the left-hand side of that large tree, there's another tree behind it, and it's uh, lighter in value and bluer? You will never see that with the naked eye, and you won't see that in the photograph. They're both going to have this exact same value, and it's going to crowd each other. So again, in the narrative world of art, you have to implement principles and rules that don't exist outdoors. Okay, I think you saw enough of that. And here is the finished painting. Wait, did we see enough of it? I'm not sure. Make sure I'm not leaving anything out, folks. Yeah. All right. That's the done deal. I use pastels for, for the building lights by the skyscraper lights. Cardboard business card. I don't have a demo for that, but I can tell you about it since um, you have, it's cardboard based, it absorbs the paint. So you can tap in some very thin lines and you can create like broken up fence posts that are deteriorated by the weather. Sandpaper. Yeah, use sandpaper for paintings. For a bubbly water at top of waterfalls or crashing waves, you can do different degrees. I used um, I use very coarse when it comes to waterfalls and crashing waves, the coarsest I can get. So it breaks it up nicely. And the more fine grain when it comes to shimmers on lakes. So let's see how we do with this painting here. Make sure you're nice and straight. Use Make sure you're 90 degrees to the frame, otherwise it's, it's gonna look terrible. So I roll a sheet of sandpaper. You roll it into like, like when you're rolling a cigarette in the old days. And you create that sheen there. That easy. Finish painting once again. Oh, for sun rays or sunbeams in a forest. Oh, I have a demo with that too. Let me see you. <clears throat> Great dry brushing effect, isn't it? No, you know what? I'm using sponge there. That's not sandpaper. That's sponge. Uh, again, um, Mr. Clean, they are excellent for that. Are you wiping out paint there, John? Yeah, you, well, it comes off automatically with the sponge. And then, you again, the idea is to have that, like, a 50% opacity so you can see through it. Because sun, sunbeams are somewhat transparent. <clears throat> All right, you saw how I did it. There's the finished painting. A walk, in, a walk in the park there. Now, this is another one that I'm sure they have not seen, Jude. Right? Uh, can I comfortably say that that's not been seen anywhere else before? A Dremel power this tool. This one here? Yeah, that's, I, I made oh, that no, one. Oh, no, the Dremel. Yeah, Dremel power yeah, tool. Dremel, you're right. Yep, yep, yep. You can put snow on trees with that. Well, here we go. Yes, Diane, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser also works. You're correct. Works the best. Look at that little spinning sandpaper. You can put snow on trees. You can put frosted snow. It creates beautiful for waterfalls on top of a crashing wave. I you I have a little bit. this course. We were all holding our breath. We thought for sure you were going to go through the paper. And uh, it breaks up the paint nicely. <laughs> Don't overdo it, though, because... <laughs> 
That's true. Jungle says they are not showing your January paint along yet on Artist Network. Oh, they are. So it, there's a thumbnail there, but just go to. First of all, if you sign up at my new at go to please go to improvemypaintings.com. Somebody could put that link there. Yeah, I've been putting it in there. Yeah, okay. You you can see the kind of work that I do. You got I got a, a quite a bit of an inventory of paintings I've done in class. They're all in class. They're no they're not done in my studio separately from my students. And there's an option at the bottom where you can sign up for the newsletter. And if you do it now, uh the the the, the uh it already went out. In fact, all all of you that have are on my email list, you already have the uh, the email just got to you of the new course. But on on at the improvemypaints.com, you have all the information for the next paint along for Saturday. It's it's the same as Artist Network. It's just that Artist Network is not displaying all my works and all you know long long bio and all those things. I, I elaborate more about the about the classes, about the materials and all that, and because I got more space on the, my website. But we're together. It's not, it's, I'm not separate from Artist Network. Now look at another application from the Dremel. I can put these little branches on there. I just wanted to call out to everyone, look where he put the highlights of that Dremel, using the Dremel. He used the white against the dark, the light against the dark, another principle of contrast. It looks lovely, right? Like the sun's hitting that white snow there. Oh, yeah, very effective. And the marks are all random. Lines and shapes are so important. We, and we talk about that a lot. Great depth. Lines and shapes are key in Joe's artwork. Okay. Belly painting. <laughs> no, uh, that's belly my painting. favorite brush stroke, guys. It's, in a certain way, it's a dry yeah. brush. But it you create bit, uh, bigger forms where you put the brush down flat and then you you lift you lift it up put it down lift it up put it down like a car accelerator up and down up and down up and down and watch the application for that what no okay here we go. And I can, I'm, I'm tilting it, twisting and turning, tilting, sometimes on the very edge, sometimes on the flat surface, sometimes in the corner. Twist and turn, corner. So how do you create the illusion of the rapids? This is the only way. It's all in the sleight of the hand. Incidentally, please check out the rocks at the top, the color variegation and the abstract shapes. And the gray on the figures is um, is not liquid. It's mask it. Yeah. Masking fluid. Correct. So also in, in, in my courses, my workshops, you will learn the, the value of abstract shapes. Rocks is a very difficult thing to paint. And the reason is that the artists are thinking about rocks. And so what you got to do is go into the new narrative world and not think rocks, but think shapes, angular shapes. Once you do that, now you're tapping into a different level. Easier said than done, but it's there. So once I once you compile it all together, it looks like a cliff with a lot of rocks. But that's because the, the viewer is putting that information together. And at the very far back, you can also see tremendous amount of color variegation there. You've got some areas that are like burnt sienna orange, and you've got some green, and you've got some yellow. All the evergreen trees are varied in size and shapes. Speed it up a little bit. 
But I like this. I want you to see this whole thing go through because it creates the illusion of the rapids really quickly. Oh, there's some dry brushing there. It is. A, it's a combination of dry brushing, but also allowing for flat areas. So. Oh yeah, I used the brush like shoveling snow. That poor brush takes a beating with yeah. you, doesn't it? It's, but it's lasted for years. <laughs> Amazing. Probably two decades already. There you go. So that gives you appearance of, uh, and there's the finished painting. They're going to go over that, like the waterfall there. Look at look at the variegation in the rock in the very foreground. Purples is a, a really beautiful add-on. Um, I don't see that enough either in paintings. I, a lot of people are not exploiting the purples, and they it it solves a muddy problem of over mixing and it, it your darks look much richer when you throw in some purple than just a cigarette ash gray that brush is uh windsor newton scepter gold three quarter inch they're hard to get um yeah the belly painting also belly painting I think I should think of another term for that. It doesn't sound very professional. But if you look at the foliage, that's how that was done. By putting the brush flat and shoving it around back and forth like a shovel, breaking it up, some solid areas. So here we have another Prince of Contrast where we have broken up paint versus solid. That's that's right there, a, a beautiful principal contrast and then a little bit of 3d negative painting in there and you got it all down pat breaking up see what if you if you do this technique where i'm surrounding it now and you overdo that it gets busy so what happens normally with artists that are merging they say well i know this is where they this is the error when you tap into the literal world you're thinking logically because you don't have another resource unless you've been told. Trees are made out of many leaves. So I've learned how to break up the paint. So I'm going to create many leaves by breaking up the paint. The only problem is you're tiring the viewer. Because now you're pixelating. You know pixels, lots of little dots. So what viewers don't like to do is to do too much brain power to process the visual information. Viewers want a quick glance at the scene and then in their mind start to daydream themselves in that painting rather than cluttering it with the, the worry of replicating nature. And that's where I really feel that, that that's where it, the rubber meets the road, to be honest. When you want to go beyond the just simplicity of, of I mean, the the attempt to copy nature and go into your own narrative world. So that 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 tree there, so to say, that symbol has nothing to do with real real um, foliage. But I have to keep those little dotty areas to minimum, and then place the solid areas next to them uh, to to create the principle of contrast. So once again, this versus this is where the answer is. Not too much one way, not too much the other way. Pastry brush. Tall grass, thin, thin twigs for bear trees, palm tree fawns, and animal fur. How many more do we have to go here? Oh my. We better speed this up here. Well, I, I think I, I could still give it another half hour. So Here we go. Anyway, this is the painting that I'm doing. That's how I created those tall grasses with a pastry brush. You can get those in Michaels, but then I I cut half the bristles off on the side so I I don't get them they're more thin, they're thinner.
and then I give it like a 45 degree angle and then come back with a rigger or whatever brush you got to do some of those little individual again don't do too many leave the principal contrast more on one side and not so much on the other stop it Joe <laughs> oops I'm violating my own principal contrasts okay here's an example on a painting I'm doing time lapse because I'm trying to cramp everything in one in one YouTube demo, right, Jude? Yeah, the reason I came up with the 45 degree angle, you can see there why. But of course, I don't create green grass. You should try doing paintings in watercolor with no greens at all. You have instant color harmony. Just throw out the greens, and anything after that is all fair game. Now. Where am I uh, pointing those strands? Towards the focal area. Those are called pointers in landscape painting. At least I call them that. Look at this brush. Little little uh, chisel edge the opposite way. Here, I'll show that one. Who would ever think about painting up upside down, right? He could if this was in a uh, paint along, but because this is a recorded, he really can't hold up the brush. Well, it's just it's one of those um, from Michaels. Uh, I can get you guys a link. You can also find them at the hardware store. Yeah, one of those inexpensive all-purpose utility brushes. They're great for grass, but don't overdo it because they're good for for. Um, Close-up grass. Don't don't go too far with it. Here, I got a link here for you all. Why doesn't it come up? There it is. Doesn't want to take it. Probably like too many characters. There it is. And again, you want your grass strands to relatively break up a little bit by pushing that brush fast. See, I'm doing really quick. Otherwise, you get these solid lines, and they are um, cumbersome. Whisper fan brush, distant grass and distant bare trees. Oh, that's for this one here. That's how I did it with those. You can use a fan brush also for your winter trees. Twist and turn. This is an interesting brush stroke. Irregular forms that vary from narrow to wide. And we're, here we go. Almost done. Again, quickly, 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 quickly. So I'm establishing the form first. See, if I didn't do that fast enough and I created a, a, a line, which you don't want. Uh, what's the name of that brush? Oops, I don't remember it. Oh, no, wait. You can use a fan brush for that, too. Follow the hands on the clock. So go from 12 o'clock on the top, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock on the right side, and 11.10 on the left side. And crisscross, by the way, so it doesn't look um, that you're, they're all going in one direction. And that's the finished painting. Oh, wait, we were doing twist and turn. Okay, tapping and dragging. 
Uh, the tapping and dragging is the, similar to what I did with the rapids, but this is for uh, skies. Look how I'm holding that brush flat to, flat to the surface. Oh, and I spot wet it, by the way. Spot wetting it here and there. Again, principal co contrast. Some areas are flecky, others are solid. Some areas are wet, some areas are dry. So if you don't know, the areas that Joe wets produces the soft edges. Yeah, that's the why. The areas that are dry produce the hard edges as well as the dry brush look. Hence the spot wetting. And that's the finished, not painting, but area of the sky. Round brush, well, okay, we'll play the video. It's no big deal. Everybody knows how to use a round brush. but So again, topping spot wetting that's very common for me to do that areas that are dry and areas that are not dry so you get that bleeding and no bleeding here we go see how lovely it is you get bleeding and then no bleeding now what the reason i'm teaching you this one that's pretty obvious is don't polka dot them give the your leaves a little of a oval shape flick them see so watch how i'm going to flick them wait we want the dry ones for that Right there at the very left, go to the left, and you can see I flick the leaves. Oops. There you go. That there, There's a good example there. Flick, flick. Make them a little bit longer. You know why that is? It creates a rhythm, a movement. And that's the finished painting. Brush corner for negative what? Negative painting of small areas and individual leaves. So your three quarter inch brush can become a one quarter inch or one eight one eighth inch brush if you want it to. Do the little flick there. And bingo. Pan pastels is a great add-on for watercolor. They are, they are just so compatible that watercolors just must have that kit. Because you can't even tell that they're pastels. Sunbeams add that special effect too. You saw it earlier with the forest, but I'm doing it here in the sky. It it just adds that that like a, a, a you know special effect, like Hollywood would do it, right? It's landscape special effect. There we go. It's it's the pan pastels is so pulverized, it's so powdery that um, you can't tell it that that it's not watercolor. You can totally fake watercolor with it. And again, you have to follow the, the sundial, the, the numbers on a clock. There's a little bit more to it because the trick is not to make them uneven, not the same. They have to be subtle. You don't want to overstate them. And that's the finished painting. Okay, we had two pending. Which ones were they, Jude? We, we can knock those off. We'll be done by 5 o'clock. 29 and 32. Thank you. I knew I'd forget them. Okay, let's do this one here. Oh, wait. Uh, wait, 29. Here it is. Wait. 
Okay, 29 we don't have to do because it's a flat wash. That, okay, I'll run it just quickly so we don't... Yeah, that's no big deal, right? Everybody can do that. The only trick is... Now, I know why I put that in there, the obvious. Because the problem is if you don't paint it fast enough, you get back runs. So the trick is if you're going to do like a large um, body of water or a large sky without clouds in it, wet the surface first so that you buy time that you don't get the back runs. Okay, so that one's pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, time-wise, uh, here we use different effects. For example, salt, you can see that vignette, the top of the, what is it, reindeer or, or buck or whatever that is. Uh, that This effect up here, this was done with salt. So you you got to hit it just at the right time where you add the paint to it. And while it's still wet-ish, it take the timing is crucial there. You um you add it and it creates that a sense of foliage. That's a nice effect. And here this effect that I got on this area here, that foggy kind of effect. Oh, by the way, I used the pastry brush for that effect to make it look like it's raining back there. But that foggy effect, what you do is you paint in the trees quickly and then you dip your brush in clear water and you tap the brush harshly and, and force the water into it to break it up. And that creates that lovely misty effect. I think we're done. So we'll talk a little bit about the next course and I'll let you guys go. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, the next course is about, you know, a lot of professional artists prefer winter scenes over summer scenes. Especially watercolorists exploit the whiteness of the snow quite a bit. Because the advantage of winter scenes is that it gives you a lot of notes of silence so you don't get a busy painting. But you got to do them right because people, if you're going to think about sales, people will not buy paintings that are shivery cold. They have to have um, the elements where they feel like it's still winter but very warm. In fact, winter scenes, if they're done correctly, they can even be warmer than summer scenes because green on the color wheel is considered a cool color. So don't think, I mean, psychologically, summer is hot and warm, but that's how your body experiences it. In a painting, it isn't. So the next course is about this, how to, I modified the photograph. This will be a water, I'm going to do this with a watercolor with all the principles that you learned today. That's just a reference photo. Look at that beautiful oil, that, that reference painting, uh, photo for oil painting. Of course, I have to declutter those trees that are front to a point. It's, it's good to put a little bit in there to give it a sense of overlapping, but... Um, but that's a great reference photo, wouldn't you think? Now, there is a technique in oils to bring out the glow of light because you can't get it that you can get it with watercolor, but you can't get it that well with, with oils because the moment you add white to it, it starts to neutralize the, the chroma of the color or desaturates it. So I have a technique where I can bring out a lot of light in oils without using white. And the third one, that pastel, we're going to get that pinkish glowing light. These are all, mod except the second one, these are edited photographs that I did in Photoshop. They're not, that's not the original uh, reference photo. And this one has also suffered a lot of uh, correction, so to say. So here's my last banner to learn more about the live paint-alongs. There's my website, very simple to remember, improve my paintings with an S. You can see my artwork there. If you feel that my artwork make, meets your expectations, and if my workshop today meets your expectations, what you see is what you get. So this Saturday, and there you go, go to improvemypaintings.com or visit Artist Network. And uh, click on the link to sign up. It would be great to work with you uh, this coming Saturday.
Okay. Well, thanks a lot for attending, everybody. And uh, by the way, if you really enjoyed this, tell your art buddies. If you belong to organizations, tell them, tell them about the course, um, the workshop, what you learned, and spread the word. We can use it. Word of mouth is how restaurants become famous. There's no other way. You can't advertise food. It's got to be recommended. You can't advertise art classes. That has to be recommended to a point. Okay, so I'll see you day after tomorrow. How does that sound? Oh, I have I one more thing. You, I have I one more. Just what? Challenged. I'm challenging everyone. Try us just once. Just I have, once. I have a, a really neat announcement. It's not an announcement, but I'm, we're trying it out. I've been discussing with Artist Network the possibility of creating a mentorship class during the week where I recruit just a few students and we do, um, they would be do it done with drills. It's not going to be paintings. It's going to be practice like how to do bare trees over and over. And it will be supervised. And the way I found out that that works better, Jude, is to use a cell phone with a, with something that's holding it. The the Logitech doesn't work, but uh, I've, been, I've, I've been experimenting. And there's a way that if you use a cell phone holder and you can bring it close, it gives you a very sharp picture. So I am able to supervise. Uh, better. I just learned that recently. So it would be a small group. I don't know, maybe 10 people at the most. I have to put that together. And uh, obviously, it's not going to be for twenty six ninety nine. It's going to be more than that because it's reduced. I, we, don't, we don't have a price yet. But if some of you are really devoted and have time, how many of you would be interested in something like that? Like this, like a, like a very small workshop. Like if you're there with me, instead of spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars, I'm sure you would vote on it differently when you knew a price but we can't give a price right now that would be above and beyond the paint alongs that would make me work more during the day week that would be uh, weekdays so if we see enough interest here uh, artist network is watching right now they might implement it or you can say subject to knowing the price at least says that we know that there's interest that's the point so they say, okay, we got numbers. Okay, we're starting to get some. There we go. It's building up. Keep going, guys. Artist Network is watching right now. If they see the numbers, they're going to say, okay, Joe, let's try it. I'm going to have a meeting on Monday. They're going to want to talk to me. <laughs> I'm speaking for them, by the way. Okay, there you go. It is working. I know the price depends. We'll work it out. Okay, but there's interest, right? And uh, by the way, at the end, you're going to be able to type in the comment section. Please help us because in the comment section, when you recommend the paint alongs and you give positive or you have the right to give negative comments, the YouTube stays together forever and the, for years and years. And the comment section is what can push people over to saying, okay, I want to sign up. So, Take, please take your time to write a, a, a comment, a review uh, at the bottom once we close down the, the, the broadcast. Okay, so I think that's all I got to say. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're so glad you took the time today to come and be with us. And we look so forward to seeing you the next three Saturdays. If you sign up, do not miss one because it's not your medium. Please come to all three. You will learn great pieces of information.